Hey guys, today we're going to try to answer the question, just how green are electric and plug-in vehicles? There's a lot of information about the environmental concerns of the proliferation of these lithium ion batteries and whether or not the production, manufacturing, harvesting of the raw materials, and ultimately waste disposal is going to offset any environmental advantage of having quote unquote zero emissions while driving. So let's take a closer look and see just how green these vehicles can be. All right, guys, thank you again for checking out Saving Green. My name is Josh. If this is your first time on the channel, Saving Green is a forum to help you make sustainability guided decisions that will ultimately save you money in the long run. And today we're going to focus a little bit more on electric vehicles and plug in hybrids. So, the first question you need to ask yourself is well, just how important is transportation to the overall greenhouse gases that are measured every day? And it turns out, quite a bit. If you look at these figures from the EU or European Union, you can see that CO2 emissions from transportation of all kinds is actually increasing, whereas other sectors of the economy are improving their carbon emissions overall. And if you further break down how much of that transportation emission is based on cars or small or light duty vehicles, you see that over 60% of overall transportation emissions are due to light duty vehicles, which would be your typical vehicle that we all drive every day. If you look at the greenhouse gas emissions in the US, we see that similarly about 28% of overall emissions are based on transportation overall. And of those, light duty vehicles account for a similar percentage, 59% to that of the European Union, suggesting everyday cars really are contributing about maybe 15 to 20% if you run these numbers out of overall carbon emissions that are pumped in the atmosphere every year. Now, when you're evaluating the environmental impact of anything, including cars, you want to conduct what's called an environmental life cycle analysis. And this looks at the three general stages of any object's lifetime. The first being manufacturing with regards to raw materials and energy and labor required to assemble the vehicle. Then the runtime usage, which is basically the daily fuel consumption of the vehicle, including maintenance costs and things of that nature. And then the last would be disposal or end of life, whether the raw materials are reused, repurposed, broken down, or disposed of. Now, most of the criticism targeted at battery electric vehicles or plug-ins is based on the lithium ion battery component of these vehicles. Now, there are a few studies that specifically focus on the manufacturing of the lithium ion batteries, and I wanted to talk about a few of them today. The first is the life cycle energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions from lithium ion batteries that was conducted by the Swedish IVL Institute. Now, this is a consortium of state and private businesses within Sweden that have looked at a variety of industrial processes with regards to their air, water, and industrial waste issues. The first and most important consideration that they consider is the size of the battery. And this was touched on in my previous video where the smaller the battery, just like the smaller the vehicle, less resources, less energy overall, ultimately the greener option. Now they estimate the carbon cost per kilowatt hour to be between 150 and 200 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Now this is based on a 350 to 650 megajoule per kilowatt hour manufacturing cost and the carbon expense based on the joules required to manufacture those batteries. Now before we get into more of the details, let's take a step back and look a little bit about how lithium ion batteries actually function. Lithium ion batteries have a cathode and an anode, which is the positive and negative ends of the battery respectively. And what's contained within them are a variety of metals and raw materials that ultimately keep lithium away from its electron. Now lithium being an alkali metal, sits on this end of the periodic table and is actually the most generous of all the elements in giving up electrons. And that's why it's used in lithium ion batteries so pervasively. Now, when these batteries are charged, lithium, which is housed in the cathode end of the battery, is complexed with other metals and compounds to maintain the stability because lithium by itself is very reactive. Now, when electricity is run through this battery, what happens is the electrons flow to one end and the lithium being separated from the electron passes through the separator barrier, which is a porous substrate that keeps the lithium and the electron separate. Now, this separation of charges creates potential energy and that's what's used during the discharge cycle of the battery to power your electronic devices. 
And this process can be repeated several thousands of times. Now there are certain limitations to the efficiency of these batteries. One of them in particular is the phenomenon of the SEI, or solid electrolyte interphase. And this is formed when lithium passes through the membrane on the anode side of the battery. It forms this interesting complex that prevents some of the lithium from flowing freely. Now this barrier actually is protective against rapid discharge of the battery and therefore explosions, which are not good. Um, but it does limit the efficiency on the order of about five to 10% of the overall mass of lithium that would be found in the battery itself. Now, the chemistry of this layer with regards to anode chemistry is a source of intense investigation. Right now, the lithium is housed in these sheets of graphite, although there are developments down the road. In particular, Tesla is rumored on battery day to be making significant advances that may ultimately greatly increase efficiency and perhaps could limit the effects of this solid electrolyte interface layer. Now the IVL does go into some other alternative battery designs and you can see here on these two tables that discuss the cathode materials and anode materials and different advantages and disadvantages based on capacity, voltage, and waste. Now with regards to battery design, the types of raw materials and harvesting of these metals is important when you're looking at the life cycle analysis. And the IVL goes even further to look at the relative composition of all of these different materials including the metals, aluminum, copper, electrolyte substrates, and the different materials and shelving units within the battery itself as a percentage of overall mass. It really depends on the manufacturing style and geography to look at the upstream analysis as to where these materials come from and their impact overall on emissions. Now, as we move into the future, Further advancements with regards to solid state chemistry and other types of battery designs may fundamentally change the calculus, but for now, this is the best we've got. And yet again, they look at the different stages of manufacturing and break down the overall carbon impact at each stage. We see that the harvesting of the material and cell manufacturing collectively account for between 50 and 75% of overall carbon emissions, whereas assembly and transport accounts for much less. Now we further can see here down at the bottom of the page that the largest part of energy use and production of lithium batteries comes from the electricity use itself in creating the batteries. And it's this reason that Tesla has decided to, with their Gigafactory, become basically carbon neutral through a combination of solar, geothermal, and hydroelectric power. So for every kilowatt hour generated, and used in the production of batteries, they will get that back in terms of renewable energy. They can achieve this through unbelievable economies of scale, but assuming that other companies can follow suit, the overall environmental impact of lithium harvesting and manufacturing in these vehicles will come down substantially. For example, a study from Carbon Brief, as you can see here, looks at the overall environmental emissions about two times lower for the average British car back in 2010. Now, as efficiencies have improved, you can see that it becomes three times lower back in 2019. And this mostly has to do with grid optimization and efficiency improvements in battery design and production. And by 2030, we can see that, yes, it's actually going to be even lower. Now, one other important study with regards to the manufacturing of lithium batteries comes from the ICCT, which is the International Council on Clean Transportation. Now, this study is a little bit more current from February of 2018. And here, they look at a range of different studies and come up with an average of 175 kilogram equivalent CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is right in line with the IVL estimates of 150 to 200. Now, they further basically estimate 35 grams of CO2 equivalents per kilometer of driving battery use. So this not only looks at the overall upfront cost of manufacturing, but they equate it over the lifetime use of the vehicle based on kilometers driven with the battery. And they basically look at the average European car and the most efficient European car, and they compare that with different countries in terms of manufacturing of the lithium ion battery, the fuel cycle analysis based on use and electrical refueling of the battery, and tailpipe emissions. And you see that other than Germany, in every other country, the EV is going to be more efficient than even the most efficient internal combustion engine. 
Now, furthermore, if you look at figure two, they compare the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions in conventional electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles over time. What seems to be fairly constant is the purple boxes or the other manufacturing, which is the actual raw materials and labor and energy required to create a car in the first place. Now, this is interesting to look at because if we want to pin down exactly what that number is, it's actually difficult to calculate. However, some companies are a little bit more transparent than others. For example, the BMW group here cites an average of 0.4 tons of CO2 per vehicle in terms of overall manufacturing. And that puts them in a very competitive camp of efficient manufacturing protocols. How efficient is it? Well, if we compare that to this study from the Guardian newspaper, you see that estimates from this article fall in line of 720 grams per thousand pounds of cost of MSRP per the vehicle, assuming that cost is a good proxy for vehicle size and materials used. Because the range is so wide in terms of what's publicly known about the manufacturing cost, some studies just use the figure of about 10 tons of CO2 per vehicle as a good estimate across the board. And again, if we go back to the ICCT study, they also look at the cost per ton of the raw materials, and these composition breakdowns are similar to the other study mentioned. Now, the major takeaways from the ICCT study show that yes, overall, battery electric vehicles are more efficient, but there are three general components that really play an important role. The first being the source of electricity used to recharge these vehicles. And grid decarbonization is the most important factor in making these vehicles green overall. And the second two are specific to end of life processing. Now they propose this second life of a mobile battery to be a stationary battery storage. And stationary battery storage is a lot less demanding in terms of thermoregulation than mobile. And therefore, even with battery degradation, meaning at the end of an eight to 10 year life cycle, about 75 to 80% of overall capacity of that battery still being used, they can still repurpose that battery for long-term energy storage, and they can significantly reduce the overall environmental impact of these batteries. They also consider battery recycling, and battery recycling is important because if they can repurpose the battery and materials for other needs, they can further cut down one to 2.5 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram mass of the battery. That can account between four to 10% of reduction in a per kilometer basis, and a seven to 70% reduction overall in life cycle emissions. And this graph really wraps up nicely on the manufacturing side the effects of different parameters, the most important being battery size in kilowatt hours. That can increase overall manufacturing emissions by a third to two thirds, which can account on a per kilometer basis of an 18% premium in carbon emissions. Now, second life in battery recycling can also significantly cut back and almost offset completely the larger size of a big battery but the most important reduction accounting for 27% in life cycle reduction in CO2 would be grid decarbonization. So with regards to grid decarbonization, the question is, well, where is our energy coming from on the grid? And fortunately here in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency can actually give you very specific information to answer that very question. So here we see the power profiler from the EPA. Now this gives a breakdown of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide compounds. Carbon dioxide we know is important for greenhouse gases. Sulfur dioxide has important implications on air quality and acidification of water and also has health implications with regards to preterm births. And nitric oxide has significant respiratory issues, most importantly with regards to air quality and lung disease. Not only is the manufacturing important, but where the energy is coming from to charge the vehicle is critical in looking at the overall environmental impact of lithium ion battery powered vehicles. Now this fuel mix is gonna be geographically dependent. And what's nice about this particular webpage is you can type in your information and look overall, even based on your own usage and your own battery size, for example, what the environmental impact will be. 
For example, we see that New England, based on this NEWE region, has 522.3 pounds per megawatt hour of CO2 versus the national average of 947. If we switch to sulfur dioxide, it's significantly less at 0.1 to 0.7 in terms of pounds per kilowatt hour and nitrogen oxide compounds, again, are 0.4 to 0.6. So this region is particularly green compared to national averages. If we jump, however, to the southwest, we see that in nitrogen, significantly higher, sulfur dioxide, lower than the national average, but carbon dioxide, higher still. Where I live in Florida, we see also pretty comparable to national averages. And if we select different areas all across the country, we can see comparisons. Now when we select an area, then we can once again look at more specifically what our monthly power consumption would be. Now this will give you averages based on national, your regional, municipal power agency averages, and then your specific emissions to get a sense of how this works. So now that we understand where the energy is coming from both to manufacture the lithium-ion batteries and to run these batteries based on power we're drawing from the grid, how does that compare to exhaust from internal combustion engines? Now national averages are provided by the EPA. We can see that for every gallon of conventional gasoline, it produces 8.8 .8 kilograms of CO2 per gallon versus diesel at 10.2 kilograms CO2 per gallon. And we see that yes, diesel does produce more CO2 per gallon, but tends to give you some benefit in terms of miles per gallon equivalents, so sometimes that can offset. However, overall, the concept of a quote-unquote clean diesel is really a misnomer, and that's what got VW in a lot of trouble. Now, you can further calculate how many grams per mile based on this simple formula here. If you know the overall emissions per kilowatt hour, just like we know the overall emissions per gallon, then we can, can get a miles to miles comparison to determine your payoff schedule in terms of carbon cost and your overall footprint. So that's the general overview of how you can get a sense of whether or not a battery powered vehicle is going to be more efficient and more environmentally beneficial overall than a gasoline powered vehicle. And you can see that it's not very simple because if you are consuming electricity on a coal-based grid, you're gonna take a long time to pay that vehicle off. It will happen, it'll just take some time. Now the estimates are gonna vary greatly, but in some of the research that I've done, it can vary between 18 months and five or six years based on the size of the vehicle, the size of the battery, and your overall driving habits. So if there are a few take-homes to think about, the three most important factors to consider are one, the size of the vehicle and battery that's needed. Two, the energy source of your power grid. And three, the amount of use, whether it be miles driven and the time that you will be having this vehicle. Each of those criteria are going to significantly impact your personal calculations and help you decide whether or not buying an EV is actually gonna be greener for you. Thank you so much for checking out this video again. I really appreciate your time. If you found it helpful, please consider liking or commenting for ways that we can improve the channel. And I'll see you next time. Thanks.